now I would like to give the floor for our first speaker. It is a pleasure to be here and an honor. I, I feel humbled by the invitation to be associated with the theme of today. Um, I thank you, Tina, and for reaching out and, and also like Tina and Maria for holding this space alongside Alessandra and Regina. So I'll be sharing my screen now to, um, to also share a little bit of my story. So can everybody see? Okay, great. So as I said before, um, I am Paulo de Tarso, that's my first name. <laughs> Fonseca Silva is my, my family name. Uh, I've got a master's degree in adult education and developmental work research. And um, during that program, I was able to put together uh, what would eventually become my career path that I'm currently uh, acting on today. Um, so aligned with my immigrant experience, I've initiated an intervention method that's called collaborative story craft, which has been applied with individuals, organizations, and institutions to acknowledge the rich diversity of people's stories. I'll tell a little bit more about how that all started. So my degree at the University of Helsinki did support my decision to become entrepreneur and start my own business. And today, uh, if I am to choose a role more so than being an entrepreneur, I would say that I am a story mediator. I will get into more details to what is a story mediator for me. So moving on, um, at my business, which is called Metaphor International, I co-founded with my partner, uh, Trisha Cleland Silva, who is um, from uh, Canada. I myself, I am Brazilian. Uh, I have been living here for nearly 18 years now. And together with Metafora, uh, we provide educational services that include new voices during transformative times. And our approach to adult learning values well-being as the basis to craft sustainable and responsible stories. And our mission is to empower authentic stories and help people work better together. Okay, so, but then it might come the question, was there a need for that? Well, the reason why I started this business, it was because there was a need for me to find a place uh, in the labor market, but also being able to create a space where my talents would be not only acknowledged, but also further developed in something that would provide me uh, a sense of purpose, but also, of course, like an income. Okay, now we're back on track. So connecting with with the theme of today, uh, why should you be ready to recruit international talents? So in order to speak to this theme, I, I really need to acknowledge my whole identity. So I need to acknowledge that I am a non-European immigrant who have been living here for nearly 18 years. Uh, and as such, I did had to go through a very specific pathway in which my previous educations were not necessarily acknowledged. And I did have to uh, work uh, in a job that I didn't necessarily complement my skills for a long time. So uh, during that job, I was able to uh, pursue uh, my first master's degree so before uh, finishing my degree at the University of Helsinki, I did a master's degree at Hagahelia in uh, tourism and hospitality management. And um, so that degree aligned with my interest in, in wellness. 
wellness and wellness lifestyle and stories. Um, but then of course, like as I start um, living my life here, I did met my today wife uh, and uh, then it really added a new dimension of my experience as an immigrant, which was to become a parent. So uh, during that time that I was not working in my field of hospitality and tourism, I pursued then uh, uh, decided to pursue a new master's degree at the University of Helsinki. And uh, so there's a very limited um, sense of like what I could work with uh, in the co social and cultural context I was living at the time. And language has always been a major theme in my story and the external narratives that uh, I encountered. There's always, there had always been a question, do you speak Finnish? How well is there Finnish? Can, well, how do you use Finnish? So, uh, so that's something I did incorporate in my experience. So a little bit more about how things unfolded. Uh, as I started my master's degree in adult education at the University of Helsinki, I did have an, my interest towards what I would like to do unfolded as a professional. So I, by this time, I did start a family. And uh, once my first child was born, I started questioning what would be her story. Like, would she be Brazilian Canadian or would she ever be called a thing? So those things really got my interest at the time and working with being exposed with education beyond uh, traditional institutions, uh, I would start researching uh, work uh, in regards to craft, craftsmanship. And uh, I learned a lot during that time. So I start combining these uh, concepts of craft and storytelling and identity. And eventually I, I uh, developed this method that was called collaborative story craft. That was really to explore and externalize people's stories and investigate their sense of purpose and identity in the place that they lived. So collaborative story craft uh, was first uh, created as a method of research, but then it was applied in many settings, just one-on-one -on -one sessions and uh, institutions like as lectures and uh, workshops with independent groups. Uh, so around this time, then I started thinking, okay, my identity has is definitely unfolding into something that I need to find a role for, my, for myself. So as a, as a family man, immigrant learner, I felt a great need to reconnect with the stories that make us who we are as a whole. And in this journey, I also found an opportunity to empower others, myself and others, by crafting stories that match our evolving identity and sense of purpose. This is the first uh, publication I did with my partner. It, it was published in 2019. Uh, so the idea of working with stories for me uh, came as like uh, a sense of like finding a place that I could call home, uh, which was pretty much like I need to make sense of my own story in order to feel comfortable as to where I live, what I do, how I work. And I do believe that we're all storytellers, whether we're doing that consciously or not. And working with other people's stories, uh, it was really uh, profound how much could be revealed when you listen to, to what we have been embodying throughout our lived experience, not only as an immigrant, but through our career path. So I started developing this role uh, of what I'll, what type of support I would like to have and understanding my story and applying that into practice. And that role became, became a story mediator. 
And story mediation then became a role that I saw that other people could also uh, embody. Not only working consciously with story, but also like applying all sorts of practices such as healthcare. So story mediation now can be defined as a support system for conscious storytelling and for crafting sustainable change in whatever type of uh, work that you're involved if, with. So I, uh, as we combine this research with practice, we got the opportunity to also document a lot of our experiences and uh, alongside our practice, we also continue publishing. So uh, together with my partner, we are story mediators, educators, and the co-creators of what we call today this uh, theory that's collaborative storytelling. So last year, we published a book on uh, um, making sense of work through collaborative storytelling that mostly, mostly focus on uh, organizations. And that book was uh, sponsored by the Academy of Finland and it's open source for whoever wants to access. Uh, and we do believe that valuing people's stories is the most uh, effective way to work, collaborate and co-create. And uh, as I said before, the work that we do aligns with research, practice, long life learning and well-being. So my takeaways from my story, uh, living as an immigrant, as a uh, uh, highly educated professional in Finland, is that um, uh, I really needed to reconnect with my story to make sense as to uh, how is my story when the context change? What is my story if I don't tell it? One thing that became clear is that if you don't tell your story, somebody else will tell it for you and you're going to be put in a box that you don't belong. And so I really needed to make sense of my values first. So you, once you make sense of your values, they will be your compacts when deciding who or uh, how you could work with, uh, who you could work with and who you can learn from. And your values also tell a story of what you're made of and what you are capable of doing for yourself, for your family, for your business, and for others. So my values in that sense, I realized that it would be a mosaic of, of uh, possibilities throughout my lived experiences and the stories that I encounter. And uh, talking about metaphors and mosaics, we created this acronym that's called TILES which stands for uh, Trade, Inclusion, Liberty, Equilibrium, and Sustainable Stories. When you talk about trade, what I'm really saying is that like, it's when you hire an immigrant, it's never a favor. It is a trade, it's an exchange. We are on par on um, exchanging learning experiences, but also offering opportunities. It's a mutual, um, a mutual exchange. And with inclusion, of course, like we can get into the sense of like including international talents, but we're really talking about including stories that are underrepresented. And liberty is the freedom to be oneself and not having to justify your identity and or aspects of your identity that you don't have control over. And equilibrium is again connecting with the idea of uh, well-being. Sustainable stories, it's uh, living and applying your values and stories that you will be proud of in the future. And regardless whether or not you're gonna be around to enjoy them. So um, another takeaway I'll have is that learning Finnish is definitely important for anyone who connects with Finnish culture. And there is no but here, and uh, it's very important to remember that language should not be used as a way to exclude talents who are already fully capable of doing the job. 
the mutual willingness to communicate, to learn and benefit from difference speaks louder than the assumptions of what is sufficient language skills. So uh, from my own experience, I learned uh, that in order to succeed anywhere really, you have to expand your network and honor your interests and the essence of who you are. By uh, buying this idea of integration, sometimes we disintegrate our story. So it is a matter of like reconnecting with your story and then doing this exchange honoring your interests and, and the essence of uh, who you are. Once I realized that, I, I noticed that there were more entryways into the labor market. I contact, I reached out through these pathways through the Brazilian embassy of things that like I could, it was a, a part of who I am really. And uh, also uh, through the, concept of story and craft and storytelling. So I start collaborating more with the storytelling organizations, story, storytelling practitioners, and reaching out to people beyond Finland. So this idea of living locally, but also thinking uh, globally did help me to uh, expand on my business and my opportunities. Uh, I would say that I'm happy with everything that I have learned and everything that I have embodied and everything I was able to be in Finland through what uh, what I was um, through my identity as a whole. I will uh, be leaving Finland next year with my family, so those are definitely taking takeaways, uh, literally. Uh, however, the link with Finland will remain as we have a, a very good community of friends and business partners that we intend to remain. So that's it from me. These are my contacts if you'd like to keep in touch. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions in the sh shortly. Thank you. Greg, thank you very much for the invitation. And then I echo everything that uh, Paulo said, actually. <laughs> Not part of my presentation, but I thought I would uh, tell you more because I too am a migrant and um, I, do, I do have Finnish roots, but I didn't know about this until I was a teenager. So my whole life I've sort of been brought up one way, but then we were told that we are now moving to the motherland and and sort of my whole life was uprooted and I was underage, so I had to move. It wasn't like a choice. <laughs> and Finland was not a country of choice. Uh, and then very shortly after, I felt that it wasn't a place for me and I moved away. And then uh, I moved to the UK and my sisters moved to the US and we were um, studying there, living there. And sort of the realization came that although I, I spoke six languages at the time, Finnish was not one of them. and uh, I had a very good education, but when I came to Finland, what I was offered was, it felt to me that it was beneath what I was looking for. And there weren't any um, university programs for bachelor level in English, but the English philology, which I <laughs> tried to get into, but was on Varasi, 105th place. Um, and so I didn't get in and I was so upset. I was like, Finland doesn't want me. <laughs> And all the jobs I could get with my wonderful languages were these migrant jobs. They were mainly like nightclubs and bars and restaurants and terraces, which were great for tips, but not so great for a young blonde person coming from Estonia, which is very conservative on drinking. Drinking is associated with a deviant behavior and uh, simply just like rowdiness and all this. And so it felt like this country is not for me. And the only place I can work is where I'm degraded, it's the 3D job, you know, dangerous, dirty, and degrading. So I left and so did my sisters. But as I said, when I was traveling around, I realized that actually being an outsider is the same everywhere. And finally, when I did come back to Finland, I did acquire a little bit of experience and education there. But I also realized that, you know, Finland is the only nation that has uh, integration as a two-way street in its wording. Uh, the rest of uh, 
integration and assimilation. And when you when you study social theory or integration theory, then you realize that there's many ways of integrating. We have examples of you know Pan Americanism, or we have the South African examples. Uh, then we have the Canadian example, which is often used in a very positive way. It's said that the Canadian way is the salad bowl, where a tomato remains a tomato, but it complements the salad. Whereas in America, it's the salsa. You know, you mix them all and they lose their shape in order to make a new one. So a new identity is formed. And I find that in Finland, it's going through waves. But I myself uh, have come to terms that I need to, first of all, be okay to be the tomato. Because there was a season where I didn't feel okay to tell people that I'm not from Finland. But now I say it and I'm okay with it and I'm okay not to be Finnish. And even when I speak Finnish, which I do, uh, there will always be a, an accent there. I think it's a mixture of all the six languages that I have. It sort of makes its own accent. But uh, when I know who I am and my values, and I see that also the society values it more. And so just as I said here on the slide, just a little bit of my career path. And um, I've always been interested in the outsider because even in Estonia, there's a very big, uh, large minority of Russian speakers. It's over 25% one of the biggest in the Baltics, um, they are still not, um, the second language is not Russian. It is still mainly Estonian. And so the Russian minority is in many ways still not fully integrated. And then among the Russian minority, there's minorities of minority. There's the English people, there's the Chechen, there's the Georgians, there's uh, a lot of Azerbaijanian and all these others. And when I was growing up, I had friends from all those groups. And very often I, I was a translator or an interpreter between them and the rest of the society. So for me, having a language was just a tool and I never really strongly identified with uh, one or the other side. And because my grandma was always uh, uh, sort of, my grandma was the Finnish person in Estonia sort of, and I guess that came with it that she didn't identify as fully Estonian. She always had roots somewhere else. She would tell stories of elsewhere. So ever since I was young, I did a lot of voluntary projects in like orphanages or just working with street kids, uh, building houses in Romania. And so when I came to Finland, I was looking for same sort of an opportunity to give back to society. And when I did finally return, I went to study social work. And I, uh, through that, worked with asylum seekers and migrants. And there I was at the same time tutoring in school. Uh, the students, uh, as an international tutor and a lot of the students were South Korean. And while I was working with uh, refugees, I had some North Korean uh, defector clients and it really made me see the world in another way. So I went to work with North Korean defectors in Korea. And then when I came back, I worked with the next step of integration. So when people receive their permits, what happens? How do you build a society around right? someone who is new they have paperwork and it says that they're allowed to be here, but how do you build a network for them? How do you empower and give them opportunities and uh, things like that? And then I went on to the next step, which would be the adult social work when they're already part of the society. A lot of it, uh, the people in adult social work were very long, like a uh, long time unemployed or they had mental health uh, issues from this long-term unemployment or substance abuse or just family problems. And, um, and then I completely burned out and I realized that, okay, I'm doing all this work, but I'm getting nowhere because it's only grassroots level and the system changes like this and people just sort of follow it. So I went to study more because actually educating yourself is one of the best ways to actually get out of the um, a rut if you are in one. And so then I went to uh, intern for the Ministry of Economic Affairs and they had just launched the Talent Boost program. And I was able to use my knowledge of South Korea to help the ministers do background uh, work for South Korea. And then they traveled there. And then I continued in Business Finland in uh, various roles, but uh, mainly carrying out the same, basically helping Finnish companies um, understand the need for diversity. And I, this is what I also focus on at the moment. And perhaps the diversity there is very strong. And even now I get a lot of uh, messages about people telling me how my title makes them think that I make all of business Finland diverse, which is not the case. If you know anything about uh, how uh, uh, corporations work, then it's, they're in silos and there's units within. So 
business Finland's role as an organization is set by a mandate from the government and its role is to catalyze new sustainable growth. So they invest financially into research and into um, the economy through investing into businesses and the, the funding comes from innovation funding, meaning that most of the companies that are invested in, they need to have an export focus. And because of this, when the Talent Boost program was made, uh, it's a ministerial program, and it was made in 2017 and 2019, a unit was placed within Business Finland. And uh, now the unit is called Work in Finland, which I come from. So sadly, I do not have the effect of diversifying all of Business Finland because it is a funding uh, organization, meaning that it's set by law and most of the work is done in Finnish. But for the work that I can, I do my best to help Finnish companies because in the end, companies are the ones hiring, not Business Finland. And so within Business Finland, the Work in Finland unit, we create national and international services. It's a, it's a sort of like a cross-sectoral across the, uh, the nation. And most of the services we make, they are on a national level. Uh, and then we try to support the regional level who actually carry out most of the work with the companies and the talents. But we, we help companies attract uh, talents through the creating a nation brand because Finland is not very well known in the world. So having a good brand is a very important thing. And it's not a problem for Nokia or Supercell to attract people. They don't even need to headhunt them most of the time. People know them so well or Kone. But the rest of the smaller companies or SMEs who actually are the ones hiring the most uh, and will be hiring the most in the future, they need more help in this. Not that they don't know how to do it. It's just that the labor market has changed. It used to be so that the companies would be in charge of uh, talent attraction and uh, headhunting. Uh, but now it's a national thing because the competition is global, right? And we're not only talking about ICT specialists, we're talking about any kind of a worker because as I said, the labor market has changed and people choose where they go in a different way. And uh, the mandate for this talent boost program, which I mentioned, the national program, which was then created in 2017, the mission there is that we make Finland attractive, attractive place to live, attractive place to study, attractive place to do business, because no business invests in a country where there are no workers. So you need to see the holistic view of the whole uh, sort of, I guess, circle of life for a migrant. And who does it? It's done in an ecosystem. It's not enough that the government does it or the city or the university alone attracts. You have to have all the players there, sort of the government, the cities, the higher education institutes, research institutes, employment and uh, company services. HRs in it are in a very big place, uh, HR uh, companies. And then uh, the international talents themselves, of course, and the companies. And our role as work in Finland is to orchestrate this because we believe that it all goes hand in hand. You cannot simply attract people, but then have no place for them to come to. And if you attract them somewhere, they have to be received. If we take a university, for example, it's great to have wonderful attraction campaigns, even go to Vietnam and tell them, come, Finland wants you. But when they arrive, they have, been, for instance, they don't have anyone receiving them at the airport, or there is no welcome package or something like this. The experience is what actually drives that. And they will say about the experience and it will feed back into the reputation and then that way actually uh, damage the attraction. I, by the way, don't see the clock. So tell me when my 15 minutes are up. Um, and why is this important? It's important because we believe that uh, international talents, they bring a lot of benefit to the business life. And there is a discussion about how international people don't like to be called international talents because either they feel that, oh, I'm not a talent because who sets the, the measure for a talent or if they're a student, they feel they don't belong in that group. Actually, students are in the group and everyone is an international talent. It's just that the needs of companies are different. And if we think of it this way, that why do we speak about company first? It's because first of all, we are a governmental organization whose clientele is the companies. So obviously whatever we make, it's for the company first. And also because when we talk about uh, economy or the business world, we have to speak about money. We have to speak about why they hire you. I do not want to be hired because I am international. 
I am not a mascot myself. I am not a chair warmer, nor you know, an image of this is our internationals, we just put them up there. I am a talent and I have effect on the pro production of the products, whatever that the company makes. So it should be talent first. Um, and when we speak to companies, they're hesitant to hire because of a lot of either no experience or poor experience, or simply the fact that it's often expensive. So we need to also acknowledge that part, that when we talk about companies, they are not the welfare state. So whenever they think about hiring someone, it's about 90% of that, the money that company earns, it often goes into salaries. And it's very difficult to fire someone in Finland. So it's important to understand the company side as well, that when they hire, they hire a profession. They hire someone because they need it for the company. The next step is that they would think about the social benefits of it and how it will diversify the company. So this is why it's important to actually help companies understand that instead of hiring in reaction, they should hire in an active uh, investment way, meaning that they invest into the uh, community and they invest into the diversity of the company through hiring international talents who are skilled and they bring all that. It's just, they bring them in a different packaging, right? And that changes the company to become more attractive and uh, competitive. Uh, but then the actual services, and I'll run through this so we actually have time for a uh, discussion afterwards. As I mentioned, Business Finland is a funding organization, but Work in Finland services are a national, um, I guess, uh, packaging of services or we are a national program and a unit. And in that, there's more than just Business Finland services. There are services provided by the key offices uh, some of them are like regional city uh, provided. And um, we tried to collect them all under one roof. So both the talents and the companies can find them in one place because the phenomena is that a lot of services are offered regionally or they're offered in one university or University of Applied Science. Um, unless you're in that circle of know-how or unless you're in that network, you don't get the information. And it's the same for startup uh, founders or uh, entrepreneurs that very often, unless they're really looking for the information themselves and they're in there somewhere networking, they don't get the information because it's a Sirbala and it's in you know other parts of the city. You started something here, the program ended, and then you have nowhere to go because you're not connected to the others. So Work in Finland is trying to connect it all into a national framework. And uh, we do that, first of all, through having web pages, which you might have visited, the workinfinland.com webpage and I will have a slide about it later. There's uh, advice for employers on how they can recruit better and how they can, for instance, uh, help the recruited international, whether from Finland or abroad, to feel welcome in the company because it's often about the onboarding. And in Finland, by the way, onboarding is very, um, is considered the job of the person hired to actively onboard themselves. It's simply a part of culture. I wasn't really onboarded, most of the people, uh, that I know have not been onboarded, but they were given a package and they onboarded themselves into the work uh, community. But it also shows that international people often need more onboarding because it's not simply the company culture, it's also the societal culture and the country culture and sort of hidden knowledge uh, that is high in context. And then um, we offer information on the webpage, of course, about the city municipality offering as well, because as I said, it varies. Then there's for recruitment services. Matchmaking events are something that um, are for people here as well. We do this in cooperation with either various organizations like AECO or then universities because universities have a lot of talent and then we support them in helping the companies come and match together with the talents or then various online matchmaking events. And then we want to provide companies uh, trustworthy uh, recruitment partners because hiring an international person does not mean they are cheaper. It does not mean you can do unethical hiring or that you get um, sort of slave labor. It's still the same. You still pay the same and they have the same rights as everyone else. So it's very important that we do this in an ethical way because we want people who come here to Finland or who are here and they're being hired for them to feel welcome, for them to be able to bring their family, and for them to have all the rights that they are, uh, the rest of the people in the society are having, 
and we want them to integrate because people who integrate well by either learning the language or um, finding a job that they really fit in and finding a community, they actually are happier in this society and the output of what they produce to society is much more innovative. It's, you know, happy people make happy products. It's a really overused slogan, but it's true. And also we, I feel that when I feel welcomed, I can also be myself, just as Paolo was mentioning about being yourself, liberty. When we feel comfortable about who we are and where we are, then we also produce better uh, services and, and we are more innovative because the frontal lobe cortex can do more work than it would do under stress and duress, right? So it's a good thing. And um, I will just jump into other, I will move this just a moment. On my screen, you don't see, but I see you. <laughs> You're blocking half of my screen. Um, there's the coaching and training. And we realized that, you know, the universities and um, uh, TE offices, they often offer coaching to the talent. It's the unemployed person that it, they need to educate themselves more. Clearly, you don't speak enough language, therefore you are not hired. But the truth is also that often the companies are the ones who are not ready yet to hire someone who is different, doesn't speak the language. First of all, because they're hiring out of a big need, so they don't have time to sort of babysit anyone, but also because they simply might not have the experience or the language skills themselves or understanding. So for this, there's various uh, programs to help the employer as well to build their capability. And we're not only just talking about international people, it's the different generations as well. Even in our own team, you know, some people are very big Excel users and they're in every meeting on time and they never call, they always email. And then there's other people who are always on the phone. They're never on time to the meetings because they're on the phone and they can't stop the call. And that's a, just a different way of working, right? One of them is a collaborative one, the other one isn't. And that is also part of how do we actually understand the skills and the people types we have in our uh, in our units and in our teams. And then for companies who are looking to hire internationally and find these partners, either for universities or uh, employment purposes, then we have talent managers, meaning that there's a person sitting in an office in the four countries. So uh, there's uh, India, Turkey, uh, Vietnam, and Brazil. And then um, Business Finland has offices in about 40 countries. Now, I think it's 37 due to the Russian war. Uh, but they don't focus on HR or they don't focus on talent attraction and connecting to universities or connecting to partners uh, in this recruitment point of view. They focus more on uh, helping businesses go to those markets. Let's say if you want to go to South Korean market. But then the people uh, who are talent managers, their focus is on helping the people find talent and sort of connect them. And then, of course, relocation services, uh, which I think now has actually just stopped. But helping companies relocate talents has been a big deal. And then we also offer talent funding, which is the last one here, for companies to change their internal internal capabilities, meaning that, for instance, they don't they recruit in a way that uh, is very selective. So why not change it to anonymous recruitment? Or they don't know how to do things um, in a way that it, uh, includes the international talent or opens up ways for internationals in Finland or outside. So why not hire a person to do that for the company? And I wanted to include this one to show you that actually it's a long process uh, and it's very uh, it's costly for companies to think about recruitment. So very often what happens is that if someone falls away from the workplace, they don't even take a replacement for them unless it's really necessary. They just pile up more work on the other work. They divide it. And this is a, in a this journey is for the company that has decided on um, hiring an international talent. But then there are those companies who have not decided. And that is also totally okay. The problem is when they need, they need resource or they need people to work, but there isn't enough of them in Finland and they are not ready to look at the other side, whether they could hire, for instance, an international student or an international living in Finland or offer an internship. So that's a place where we try to help companies, first of all, uh, sort of scale and um, see what their needs actually are, and then to overcome those fears, because very often it's to do with fear. And it's a long process. So very often recruitment, whether in Finland or abroad, abroad, it of course takes longer uh, if there's also permit processes, but it can take months. And that's another thing 
to get used to as an international is that in Finland things just take longer, but in other places they happen very fast. You're hired very fast, you get replies very fast. But here companies are not accustomed to that yet, unless they have been recruiting internationally or, uh, before. So in that, we also wish to support them. And just to run through these uh, services, I think I have four or five of them and that's the end. So Imago, as I mentioned, um, services for companies, this is one to help companies. Um, it's a three-day training for companies to understand the value of employer branding and to rethink how they can do theirs better because it, employer branding nowadays is very important. We buy products based on packaging, right? So if a company's packaging is not suitable, then we choose other places. We choose where we feel that we belong or we can fit in. And the talent funding that I mentioned is for companies to uh, grow their internal capabilities or change the structure. Uh, it's uh, uh, followed by the mentorship program, which is uh, for SMEs. And uh, the idea there is that we can buy a lot of things with money, but the truth is that very often the, the services we buy, we don't actually integrate them into our everyday life. And leading a company's heart, but leading international people in a team, statistics show that international teams, they are more volatile. There's more disputes. There's more misunderstandings. But when they are led well, the change management is done well, then they produce better results and they're more competitive on the market. But it's hard to do as a leader. And we know that burnout rates for leaders are very high. So we wanted to offer them a program where they can walk uh, side by side with another leader who has gone through a change in their organization or personally has led a change of, for instance, language or something in a company. So here's a, a leadership program. Our mentorship program for leaders and it had the previous one ended just in november it's a 10 month long program and it was very popular so now there's a new intake for smes if there's any smes in here you should check this out but it's uh, in finnish because we have uh, detected that the finnish smes are the ones who are in need of this and then if the companies are not yet ready to jump into the funding or the, um, the mentorship program, then we have also compiled a playbook for them. And in this playbook, there is a diversity uh, tools that they can use, many of them free of charge. And uh, these tools can be integrated quickly into the uh, organization. And it was based on a two-year work, a mastermind club that we had with about 14, 15 companies. And uh, their HRs and diversity people would come together monthly and discuss what their companies are doing. And then we decided that why don't we just compile all these good examples into a playbook? And it was launched in September. And then, of course, as I mentioned, there needs to be a number to call. So there is this uh, call, call your friend, sort of international recruitment advisory service for employers. It functions as an operator and they will connect to the right service or then um, they will themselves answer. It's a nationwide service and they're very well connected. And then the web pages I mentioned already. And uh, as a disclaimer, on the web pages, there's a lot more. So now I have only raised questions that or topics that related to diversity because uh, that was a, a task given to me. But on the web page for employers, there's a lot more uh, for employers who want to hire and they need more specific guidance. We have a guidebook there. And uh, there's also other tools and uh, tools for their own marketing pages and things like that. So if there are employers online, do check it out. And the uh, .com site is for talents. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. We can. Today, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about sharing my experience of building an environment for language learning and communications at a very traditional workplace that is very known to be more about communications on Finnish, working with audit assurance and working with very traditional services. So let's first go a bit through the introductions. So my name is Alexandra and I work as a tax and legal technologist at PwC Finland. So currently I'm a manager and I also lead the team of four trainees who work with a very exciting 
tasks related to data analytics, process automation, and digital transformation. And last year, just a bit by chance, my friend invited me to join inclusion team at PwC. It's a grassroots movement, which goal is to promote inclusion and diversity at a company where primar primary language of communication has been finished for a very, very long time and drive the transformation from a very traditional uh, Finnish language workplace to an international and inclusive work environment. And that's how I ended up being a lead for language and culture subgroup that focuses on integrating people through strengthening their language skills. And by language skills, we mean not only speaking Finnish or speaking English or Swedish, it's also about generally talking simple, taking different cultural considerations into account and being inclusive and empowered through the language. A bit about uh, my own background. So I originally come in from Republic of Karelia, based in Russia, Petroskoy, and I have Karelian roots myself. But I was never exposed to Karelian language, and I feel a bit I am missing a part of my roots, but at the same time, my background and my identity of Karelian made me become a type of a bridge builder. So a person who, who can bridge different, very diverse group of people. So at my usual work, I connect business and technology experts and through the language and culture subgroup, I connect people who come from very different cultural backgrounds. Some of them have just recently moved to Finland from South Africa, and they at the same time are exposed to very harsh November climate conditions, but they also have to learn how all the industrials work works in Finland and also drive their own integration and integration of other audit employees. So for me as a Karelian, language has always been not only a tool, but a way of cultural empowerment and a way to inspire people to build a constructive dialogue. And in my free time, I have also been running a Start Your Finnish blog, where I share my own experience about learning Finnish and Swedish, and even using social media to learn languages. So instead of just Instagram doom scrolling, you can actually find it as a tool to learn spoken Finnish language or to connect with other people who have the same struggles as you and even learn a bit more about Finnish society as a whole, especially during COVID times. I think social media was the main way to connect with the outer world. And previously I have studied at the University of Helsinki and I completed master's degree in international business law. So for me as a lawyer, again, language is a very tricky thing, but it empowers people people who come from abroad, people who recruit international talents, and everyone. But next, we can go to looking into how we can actually support language integration at the workplace. So myself, I have been um, international talent looking desperately for a job, trying to figure out who am I, am I a business graduate, as I have also studied at Aalto University. Am I a lawyer? Am I an artist? Because I also paint in my free time and I really enjoy creative hobbies. So I know the path of international talents and the struggles they have. And at the same time, I also drive recruiting other international talents to our tax and legal technology team. 
so first there is a perspective of one person who is struggling to find his place at the workplace and at the same time in the whole Finnish society. And then there is a whole workplace, the employer, the HR team, who also have their own struggles. As an example, trying to figure out how the new government program might affect the international talent retention, trying to find a way to figure out residence permits, trying to find a way how to draft an inclusive job posting. So there are two perspectives, but they have to be brought together in order to build a successful workplace and ensure that communication flows in different languages. So first, let's dive a bit into the perspective of an international talent. So first, you might be a student just going through the exams in English, doing your UKI test to get a Finnish citizenship or to get admitted into the courses. But when you come to the workplace, you have new challenges. Each workplace has its unique professional vocabulary. It has its unique professional slang that might be a bit of a struggle even to a Finnish native speaker. And on top of that, there is a layer of unwritten communication rules, writing your first emails and finish doing presentations, making your first client call. So when I started at PwC four years ago, I actually didn't know what will be my working language. I was a bit afraid to ask that. And when I joined, my first working day was, oh my God, a client demo at the client place and we had to speak Finnish and I was the only one non-Finnish native speaker in the team that was visiting the client space. But then there was always a peer support. I have gotten a lot of support from my manager and from my colleagues just trying to learn how to phrase that email and how to make sure that my communication is understandable both to my Finnish native speaker colleagues and international colleagues. That's also how I learned the importance of keeping it simple and also using simple Finnish. Because when I work as a consultant and I try to explain very complex data analytics and technology aspects, I need to make sure that my language doesn't get overly complicated both to Finnish native speakers and non-native speakers as well. And at the same time, because I'm also a technologist, I learned how we can actually use artificial intelligence to support the onboarding of international talent. And this is something that is very important for the workplaces to consider as well. So when we have this Microsoft Copilot projects, you can use it as a way to onboard your talents and support their journey, support proofreading their presentations, emails, and get in technology assisted feedback in addition to human empowerment. And of course, when you have this one-to-one -one with your manager, it's very important to focus on how managers and how the work community can understand the struggles of international talent in career path and work together in the job crafting. So if the Finnish language is not your strength in the first year, it can become a strength in four years. And that's where employers and HR teams should have their patience and should have their commitment as well. Essentially, that's where we come to the point of having the whole workplace in focus and creating a common playground for how we choose the language of communications, because it's very important that when you talk to an international employee, you also see their needs to practice Finnish language. As a very common point, don't immediately switch to English, because that might make the international employee feel very uncomfortable. 
And another thing is about having collaborative approach in planning the language integration. And when we talk about the collaborative approach, let's look into how we can, in practice, enable language learning at work. Here, I'm going to share some practical examples uh, that we have had at PwC Finland, driving inclusion teamwork together with our human resources team and together with inclusion and diversity steering committee. And I would like to highlight that when you want to ensure a successful integration of international talent at the workplace, it's a lot about building a community and creating the fear of belonging, because that's something that many, many workplaces are struggling with, especially in this post-COVID weird environment when people work all across the world, people struggle to come to the office, even if they're already integrated into the Finnish society. So here I provide some points on what you can consider at, their, at the workplace. First example, a language cafes, where you actually set the tables, you put the language names, Swedish, English, Finnish, and you make people just come together and practice their language skills in a very uh, warm and very open-minded environment. Another way, is to set a language body program. So to create tandems and match pairs based on their desire to strengthen language skills and exchange cultural experience. In addition to that, it's very important to thorough plan your onboarding and even assign a body that has a drive to commit to inclusion and introduce the international talent to the new working environment and help them with their integration path. What I really like about PwC is also uh, how we are as consultants are uh, supported with the language upskilling. So it's possible to take courses in Finnish and in business English as well at the workplace. And then last but not least, we have extensive inclusion training for team leads and for all PwC employees. So there is a learning module that goes through key aspects of ensuring inclusion and belonging in the workplace, fighting your own biases, becoming more open-minded, regardless of what your background is, where you come from, and what is your language. So next, I would like uh, to conclude my presentation with a key message that building inclusive workplace requires a joint effort. It should be community driven and its main goal should be strengthening the feeling of belonging for all em employees, no matter what is their background and what is their mother tongue. Thank you.